Welcome to Pet Hub's Facebook Live. I'm Lorian Clemens. This is Hedy Pamar, and our special guest is Robin Bennett. She is working with us uh, a lot on <laughs> training Miss Hedy, uh, and she is a dog guru. In fact, her company is called Dog Gurus. Robin, we we neglected to do this the last time that we met. So, would you give everybody a bit of this quick highlight of who you are and what you do? Sure. So, I am Robin Bennett. As Lorian said, I am a certified professional dog trainer. I've been a dog trainer for uh, like 30 years now. <laughs> Seems kind of amazing. But I'm also the co-founder of a company called The Dog Gurus. And at The Dog Gurus, we help pet care professionals launch, grow, and profit in pet care business areas. So that's what I do. Awesome. And Robin and I have known each other for, I was trying to remember this, six or it's seven years. It's a while. Years. It's a while. It's a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and... Uh, yeah, definitely. And Robin has actually been with us uh, and our pups uh, even remotely because we, we, you have actually never done any training with my dogs in person, but you've <laughs> helped us along the way uh, with quite a few uh, challenges that we had. And then when we brought Hetty into our home uh, just before Christmas, uh, because that was a good idea with the toddler, um, we uh, decided we were going to enlist uh, Robin's help and actually follow her raising your puppy 12 week series. And we're getting close because Hetty's now five uh, months old. And I was I was admitting to Robin before show, we're, we're actually about two weeks behind and that's just because a uh, toddler uh, is also in the house. I have a 20 month old as well, but we are um, making a lot of progress. So we have about six weeks left to do rather than just four weeks that we technically should have left. But anyway, <laughs> so let's check in. We've got a lot to check in about and we actually have, um, some questions that came in from uh, one of our, our viewers, um, and we'll get to that later, but let's check in first and just kind of do like an update on Hetty and uh, how she's doing. So um, she's asleep right now. We actually, um, I took the, op well, not asleep, but she's just groggy. We took the opportunity. She's very right groggy. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, we took the opportunity right before uh, this to do a quick little training session because I very rarely get time where, Sagan, my son, is not uh, wanting to be involved. And he loves, loves, loves being involved with giving treats to Hetty when she does the right things. And he certainly loves going, ah, ah, when she, she doesn't do something. <laughs> um, and he's, he's very, he's always on her. He's watching her because he obviously watches mommy and daddy like a hawk. But um, for her, the biggest challenge that we're having, and Sagan doesn't help, is impulse control. So, we started uh, about four weeks ago with the impulse control lessons um, that should eventually lead to leave it. And um, we've gotten as far as to using the leave it command. But one of the things I was mentioning before we started today, we have to start every training session with reminding her about leave it and reminding her about impulse control. She she sees no matter how we put the treats, like whether they're in one of our little uh, canisters like this or in the treat bag or in the actual bag that has the uh, or treats from the store or whatever she, she's like oh my god I'm so ready for this and she starts pawing at us and you put it in your hand and she's pawing at you and obviously that's exactly what we're trying to keep her to do once it, it's taking less and less time now like maybe 15 20 seconds now to be like yeah I ignore her I turn away and she's like oh wait a minute I'm not supposed to paw anymore but I'm feeling like at four weeks this is it's, it's frustrating and especially when you've got our two cats, one of whom is very interested in training time because he likes the treats too. Yeah. And then uh, the toddler, um, it makes it very hard, I think, maybe for concentration for her. I think that may be part of the issue. But anyway, I'd love some thoughts about how can we get this impulse control thing so we can move on to the next step. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a combination. One is that she's at that age where right around five, six months, um, sometimes a little bit into seven months as well, they start to kind of test the waters. So a lot of times <laughs> things that you may have taught them and thought they knew really well, all of a sudden they're like, hey, why don't they do this anymore? So it's kind of like mm -hmm. the preteen stage of a child where they're like, yeah, they know all the rules, but now all of a sudden they're kind of testing the waters to see, did she really mean I couldn't do this or couldn't do that? So I think it's a little right. bit of that. I also do think that every time you change the, what it looks like for the dog. So you add distractions, you add a cat or two, you add <laughs> a toddler running. Like every time you change that picture, the dog is going to regress a little bit because dogs don't generalize very well. 
So mm -hmm. I think I might've given this example before, but if you train primarily in the kitchen, like let's say you teach a dog to sit in the kitchen, they literally think sit means when I'm in the kitchen, I should sit down. <laughs> so you have to train yeah. them in multiple places. So if you're finding yourself training in a wide range of places and a lot of different distractions every time, that's going to cause that little bit of regression, but you're doing exactly the right thing. You just wait it out, you know, ignore her until she settles down. I do also think there could be a little bit of, um, especially with the cats, a little bit of, I need to get it before them, which yeah, make yeah. her forget about the training and actually just say, I got to get there first, which yeah, is like a almost a little resource guarding, which we we don't want to, right. to get. At all. So I think that you may actually even want to set up more scenarios if, if the cats aren't, you know, trying to actually get the food from you as well. If you can control that, <laughs> I would set up more scenarios where she is learning to do like sits or, or lay down or even just a five second stay or whatever with the cats around. I think that would help too. Yeah. And we've had, I mean, like just giving her food we actually we had a specific place we were giving it to her and then we realized it wasn't working as well mostly because of the toddler he didn't care at first but then all of a sudden he was like oh this is where the food is i'm gonna go play with it so we had to move it but then as soon as we moved where we were doing her feeding her ability to sit and like wait for the food just like vanished <laughs> and right. so and, and that's so just now, re, that's just retraining her in that same space because and that's yeah. with every dog it's just they don't generalize so you literally have to start all over and the more locations you do the training the more they will start to generalize to say oh this is the same thing even though i'm in another spot or another room or another whatever. exactly well we've actually been ch changing up like deliberately changing up okay sometimes we'll feed her before we eat sometimes we'll feed her after we eat i mean she's always eating within a range of uh, that hour but the more predictability we were giving her, then if that predictability was uh, disrupted at all, the more she was regressing. So right. we're, we're trying to, I mean, because frankly, life with kids in general, much less a, a you know a toddler, uh, means that you can't keep everything right you know, perfect all the time. So yeah, yeah. So I think you're doing exactly the right thing, and you do have to remember she is still super young. Yeah, so she although is, it seems but, like oh, she should know this by now, but she's still really yeah. young. And she's now just at that stage where she's like, I did know it, but now I just want to make sure that's what you meant kind of. Stage. Yeah, it was interesting. I'll tell you just, just last night, actually, we had a, a case of a pretty significant regression, but it was interesting. She and uh, uh, my son were racing each other up and down the hallway, which they love to do. And I got in the way and I was trying to get out of the way of toddler and she basically took out my legs. And uh, I went down and uh, um, hit my knee pretty hard and, and it hurt me. And I think she knew it hurt me. And the entire rest of the night, like she was a basket case. Um, and so we were like, wow. And so it, it also kind of reinforced me, like my, my uh, older dogs would be like, eh, whatever mom fell. <laughs> <laughs> but with the younger dog, I mean, I, I have to remind myself, they're so impressionable. Right. When they're exactly. that young. And, and we, we had to co co convince her, like, you know, come over here. You do, you know, you're not in trouble or anything. Like that. Even though mommy did cuss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's all, it's all good. So I'd love it. Let's move on to um, one of, um, and I, we're going to show a picture here, one of Hetty's litter mates. His name is Mando. Isn't he ridiculous? So um, and he looks so much like her. He's a black and white rather than a seal and white. But uh, other than that, they look like so, so like it just kills me. Anyway, Mando, um, his mom reached out to me and she asked about, you know, aggression issues. Now, Mando is doing great. He's actually doing better with impulse control and leash training and all that than Hetty is. But what the issue is coming is that there um, seems to be that he's having some which he is worried are aggression issues. Like maybe he's getting overstimulated uh, during play. So she mentions, for example, that um, that he, um, when they're playing, he sometimes starts to get really aggressive in the playing and he's lunging and he's biting. And she's also got younger children, not quite as young as I have. She's got a couple of kids. And so she's just wondering like, is there something that we can do? And there's a couple of follow-up questions on us too, but like in terms of like play, he's getting really aggressive. Yeah. So actually that's a great point because this is fairly common in a lot of puppies and with any dog overstimulation, what we call in the training world, um, arousal in a dog, that's that high energy, like, Whoa, I want to get going. It can be sort of a fun thing, but that is linked to aggression. So it's the mm -hmm. same chemistry going on inside the dog 
that is why, and the example I always give, cause this happens in humans too. The example I always give is that I, I use hockey, um, at hockey games, when you get the fans get all revved up and then next yeah. thing you know, a fight breaks out in the stand, same thing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the secret to that, and the same thing, if you have kids on the playground, you'll know, and you'll see this too, when, uh, your toddler gets a little older, you'll know when <laughs> they start to get to a turn. And probably this happens now when he starts to get to a certain level, you're like, we need to stop. This is going yeah. to not end well. Um, it's the yeah. same thing with puppies. So the biggest secret to that is trying not to let that arousal level get too high. So when you are playing, I like to do lots of breaks. Um, we play a lot of freeze game. I and mean, I think we talked about this in one of the calls that we were on. I can't remember, but um, freeze tag where you get the kids and the dogs to run around. Then you say freeze. Kids already know if they've played the game before, they have to stop running and freeze. And then mm. you get the dog to sit and you might need a treat or something to help them do that. But you're basically pausing the action to give the dog a few seconds to settle down so that it doesn't spill over into that like out of control over arousal situation. Yeah. And I, we've actually found that with, with Hetty, I wouldn't say it's aggressive, but we, we sometimes have to do like a quick little reset where right. she, she's just clearly like getting too into the game with Sagan and Sagan's like, ah, I'm done. And right. so we just, do a little distraction with her and then she's like oh okay i'm going over here so that that reset button is really important now um his, his mom talks about um putting on a collar and how that's um it took forever for them uh to to be able to get that collar on without him biting and nipping now i'm not going to say that hetty loved getting the collar on but like after like the first or second time she's like okay yeah this is a thing i'll deal with it um and um so she would she would you know the her, Amanda's mom is just like, why is this an issue? And, and is, is it related to the same thing or is it something else? It, it's, it's hard to say without seeing the puppy, obviously, but it does sound like it's similar in terms of personality because dogs like people have different personality traits and different temperaments. And that can, that can range obviously within a litter. So you're going to get lots of different personalities, just like if you have triplets, all three of them are not going to be the same either. Right, um, right. But I would say that dogs do what works for them. So if it's a situation where you're trying to put the collar on, the dog doesn't want the collar on, that goes back to a lot of the handling that we talked about and why a lot of those handling exercises are important. Um, I would start with just trying to get the dog used to being handled without the collar even involved. But obviously you got around that, so he's able to get his collar on now. But a lot of that is just the dog going, nope, I don't want it. And then if that works, if they nip and you say, okay, that collar didn't go on, then they're going to try that even more consistently right. in the future because they're because reinforcing that, that right they're accidentally yeah. you're accidentally reinforcing them for that but at the same time it's not like you want to pin them down and like you know force the collar on them either because that's going to make them not thrilled with the whole handling situation so for all of that if you're having trouble with any puppy and you're having trouble doing anything that involves handling whether it's picking them up touching their nails clipping their nails brushing them checking their ears i would go back to ground zero and just start doing making a really positive association between that type of touching and treats or a toy or food or whatever, so that you're yeah. making the association that it's okay when this happens. Well, and, and, and I love it too, if you can talk about, cause you and I talked at the very beginning about what's the best time to start those handling. Exercises. Yeah. Well, yeah I mean, not I in terms would, of like age, but I mean, just in terms of like the day, time of day and the, you know, the, yeah, the I would always start that kind of like with the stage that Hetty's in right now <laughs> that like, <laughs> When you have the collapsed dead, dog, dead so, weight. <laughs> but honestly, that it what you want to do is set the dog up for success. So the best time to do it where you're most likely to succeed is when the dog is really tired. So those are exercises I used to start when the puppy, my puppy would go to sleep. And so while he was in that groggy stage, that's when I would do some of that handling and not doing it like for 20 minutes, I would just do maybe three or four times, check his ears, touch his paws, give him a couple of treats. And then that was it. And then you break that over. The great things about puppies is they sleep a lot. So you can do a yeah. lot of those throughout the day as they're sleeping. Yeah. We, and I actually do that a lot, with, particularly with that. We, we took about three hours of a course, a nap that took three hours. It was on the couch. That's when I did her nails. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And she kind of like goes, oh, oh, you're doing my nail. Wait, I don't know that I want that. Treats in the mouth, the nails already clipped. And she's like, yep. okay, fine. <laughs> So, exactly. She's getting she's getting that. The the, the next one, the last one that uh, Mando's mom asked, I think is probably the most 
when I heard it, I was like, mm. because um, Penny, my boss interior uh, that you helped us with a lot, um, I lovingly called her my jerk face dog um, <laughs> because she was very uh, people aggressive. Uh, and I had, I had assumed that that came from her, uh, which her, how she began her life, which was in an abusive situation. And I made the assumption like, oh, this is because of the abuse. But I'm now wondering like, hmm, is it something else? Because this idea that the puppy wakes up in attack mode, we definitely would see with um, Penny. It wasn't ever with me, but it was with other people. Um, and this one, uh, Mando apparently, uh, when he wakes up, he's super grouchy. And, or when he's woken up, uh, he is super grouchy. And when another, when her, one of her older dogs uh, came up just to sniff him, uh, puppy woke up and, you know, they had a tussle. So thoughts on that? Yeah. So that one is more concerning to me. So I would first, the thing I would do is rule out to make sure there's not some kind of a medical problem going on, you know, something where the dog doesn't feel good and that's causing that type of behavior. And then I would try to see in a safe way, if that happens all the time, is it certain times a day? Is it, if you call the dog, not that I'm saying go up and like shake the dog and wake him up. But if you, if the puppy is sleeping and you call him from the other side of the room, does he wake up? Is he able to just respond and come over? If someone does go closer to him, does he do the same thing? So, or was it specific to being woken by a dog, which still isn't the solution. It's just, you're trying to find out what are the parameters that would actually trigger that behavior. If it is every single time, I would definitely rule out any kind of medical condition. The second thing I would look at in terms of all of this behavior that the last three questions have kind of covered is I would look at the diet Sometimes diets that have a lot of chemicals in it or a lot of ground yellow corn or a lot of um, preservatives, a lot of times those can cause dogs to act a little wacky. And so mm -hmm. making sure they're on a, a good diet is also going to help. So I would look at that as well. I got I to gotta back you up on that because when we had uh, issues with Penny, they got a lot better when we actually realized she's allergic to these three things. And when we took those three things out of her diet after the that she was diagnosed. Um, we did go through the vet to get that diagnosed. We took those three things out. All of a sudden her mood got a lot better. And the other thing for her, we, as you know, she had a medical issue with her eye. Now, man, was super young. I would doubt that this was an issue with him. But with her, we were, honestly, as soon as we got the eye removed and stopped trying to fix the eye that was in pain, like it was a different dog. Right. Uh, she she was like, oh, OK, fine. Thank you. I no longer have to be a grouch to you guys because like you helped me. Finally, I've been yelling at you for years. <laughs> yeah, you know, kind exactly. of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would definitely say, like, always rule out the medical or the allergy thing because inflammation makes you cranky. I mean, right. Exactly. It, it just does. Um, so that, that's really great. And I would also to recommend, I mean, from my perspective, I don't know if you should back me up, you know, back me up or or um, tell me I'm wrong. I would say getting a consult from a professional trainer was not be a bad idea at this point. You want to kind of nip this stuff in the bud. Yeah, I was actually going to say I would try to find a trainer that um, specializes in positive reinforcement because this is a situation with a puppy like that that's pretty assertive that when you try to counter that with any kind of force, like I'm going to pin them down or I'm going to roll them over, that for these kinds of puppies tends to make them much, much worse um, mm -hmm. because they're not they're willing to fight back. So yeah. not that I recommend that for forceful training methods anyway, for a whole bunch of reasons, but for a puppy like this, it usually will make them worse. So you want to find someone that does positive training and have them do a consult because you're right at a young age, there's, there's that, there's that category of like how much of this is temperament that they were born with. But then there's also the whole nature nurture. There's also a whole lot you can do um, right. because it is a puppy that you can work on that. So yeah. And, and we got started with Penny help. kind of too late, um, not too late, but we got started with Penny so late on doing some of that positive reinforcement stuff. We then had to just find mitigations that helped right. her get through situations rather than really, you know, doing that behavior modification that from the beginning that would have helped her a lot more because it was, right. it was kind of a nature nurture thing with her for yeah, sure. I think. Exactly. Awesome. That's great. That's great feedback. Um, so I thought it, it's like for the last little portion that we have today, we have just a, a little bit of time left. I would love if you can kind of talk to me about like 
So what should we be working on next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say when you were like lamenting that you were behind, I was going to say, well, this is why we give you over a year's access to the program <laughs> because the training, I mean, although it's geared towards the puppy's first six months from the time you get them until six months of age, that really, it never stops. You know, that whole first year you're really working with the dog. So I would really be pinpointing some of the stuff we already talk about. You already know impulse control is a big problem and probably a biggest challenge. So I would keep working on that. I, and the reason I say that is as humans, we tend to work on what the puppy is really good at because it makes us feel ah, good. So we're mm -hmm. like, he can spin. I'm going to have her spin uh, a bunch of spins. She does awesome tricks. Like awesome right. tricks. She and picks so up that, balls right away. <laughs> and that's what you'll end up deferring to that because let's face yeah. it, it's more fun for you. It's more fun for her, but just make sure that you're setting aside time where you're doing the impulse control exercises and really working on that. And then I would just start to look and with COVID, hopefully starting to come to an end, start thinking about, you know, are there things that she's going to be exposed to like you mm -hmm. falling, for instance, that, <laughs> that she hasn't been exposed to. And are there things that you need to get her out in a safe way? I know in the very beginning we talked about because of COVID, you really can't do a lot of socialization, but as things start to open up and knowing that hopefully as vaccines start to come on board with more and more people, you will be taking her more places. So just thinking about, are there things you need to work on um, that she might be nervous about or scared of, or just has never been exposed to that you might yeah. want to start planning on so that it's not a total shock the first time she goes out in for real. When for real out there. Well, and I'm excited too. She's now officially up to date on all of her vaccinations. So we are just starting to now venture out past our little, we've had a little tiny bubble that we've right. been doing leash work on and stuff. So I'm excited. Like we're going to get her out on the trail this weekend, you know, we're yeah. going to do a short little hike. But, um, you know, more than just up and down our hill in the backyard, like actually get her out there. Um, yeah. So as you start doing that, then start to watch is there, you know, mm -hmm. if people approach, does she get nervous or if dogs are passing her, does she get nervous? And then that'll give you ideas of things that you want to continue working on as she grows up. Yeah. yeah. I've been thrilled though, even with COVID, um, we didn't get a full hundred. I think we got to 65 or 70 That's great, uh, though. people. Yeah. And uh, we've had a couple people just recently coming over for different, you know, repair work or whatever. She's a delight <laughs> with strangers. <laughs> and so, which is so different than Cujo Penny, uh, who would basically rip your face off if you came into her house and she didn't tell you she could. And so, uh, yeah, Hetty is just like, Hi, welcome. Here's the here's the china. Here's the mom and I keep their jewelry. Welcome oh, that's to our awesome. home. Oh, that's yeah. great. She won't be at all uh, a good uh, watchdog. Not the watchdog. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. While I've got you on, I want to totally radically, and just for like the last three minutes, we are doing some investigations right now on senior dogs because we've been so focused right now on puppies, 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 right. and we're getting ready to do some content about senior dogs. I would love it if you can give, I am totally putting you on the spot I know. <laughs> But like, if you can give us just a couple of your thoughts about, you know, best ways to either training with uh, senior dogs or, or best, you know, toys and tools, interactive things with senior dogs, you know, those dogs that maybe getting a little creaky and they're not one to go rough, rough and tough old. Like yeah, other dogs you know, the, the number one thing I think with senior dogs are like low level walks, obviously, but really the number one thing I recommend is anything having to do with nose work any type oh. of scent activity. So it can be as simple as throwing some kibble in the backyard and teaching them to go search for the kibble or using the snuffle mats or some of the puzzle toys are good for the senior dogs, but some of them don't have the patience to, to mm -hmm. get some of the food out and they don't always have the dexterity to hold the toy and get the food out. But nose work, like their noses work great still. And that's yeah. one of the things we've, we've seen that in a lot of the daycares that we work with that are starting to see older dogs and coming to daycare. And obviously they do not want to be with the, you know, the, the hoodlum cra crowd of yeah. teenage dogs. <laughs> they just aren't having fun there. So they really, but they thrive when you give them little courses of trying to find treats and just hidden places or hide them in toys or whatever. But yeah, n anything to do with nose work. Can you talk a little bit about snuffle mats? Because I just discovered snuffle mats, and I bet you a lot of our uh, people oh, watching right now are like, what is that? mats are awesome. So snuffle mats, I always say, and this dates me, it's basically like a shag rug. <laughs> with, for those that remember <laughs> shag carpets. Um, it's basically a mat that is 
has either made is you most of the time it's made of fleece of some sort, but it's just really long threads and you can hide treats in it. And then the, the point of the snuffle mat is you put the snuffle mat down and then the dog has to sniff and find all those hidden little pieces of kibble. And I'm talking like tiny treats you hide in there. And yeah, they, yeah. I thought when I first saw it, I thought, there's no way the dog's just going to pick it up and like throw it around and all the food will fall out, which I have seen a few dogs do that. But most of the time the dogs actually will sniff and it's working their brain as opposed to just giving them a handful of food. It actually works their brain. So they have to find those treats. And so anything awesome. where you're hiding treats and getting dogs to find it, you can actually teach them to, to scent to certain odors as well. And so that's a little bit more advanced teaching them to find like a specific scent, but just teaching them to find food. They do that naturally. But that's a oh, yeah. great activity and it will really tire out. It tires out any dogs, but it definitely tires out the senior dogs who don't have the the strength maybe to go on like a 10 mile walk. Right. And, they, and they're not really, I mean, I know that when um, Penny got to a certain point, like we had the little soft uh, balls that were, that we stuffed into the hide and seek, you know, toys, like the, like the uh, squirrel and the log yeah. and stuff like that. So she, she still liked to do that kind of thing, like the softer toys, but her teeth were getting bad and, all these things that she didn't want to go play fetch anymore. Right. So she like we what we would sometimes do is put treats inside of those um, softer hide and seek toys too. And she did like to go in that. So that's the same type of thing. Um, yeah. Anything, really even teaching them to find people. I mean, if you hide and then call the dog and have a big party when they find you just hiding in the house, you can do that with Penny too. But, but that's, yeah. those are the exercises that I love to do with older dogs. I love it. That's great. Thank you so much. That's really terrific. I want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, Robin has created this great course called Raising Your Puppy. It's an incredible, incredible uh, tool. It's what Hetty and I are using right now. Uh, you can find out about it at doggurus.com. Uh, and I would highly recommend it. Um, and Robin, thanks again for all your help. Uh, and uh, hope to be talking to you again soon. All right. And uh, we'll keep you up to date on uh, the progress of the little. Hetty Pamar monster. <laughs> She's gotten so much bigger. Oh, 13 and a half pounds. So wow. yeah, yeah she was, her, she was less than four. It was great talking to you again. We'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Check us out on our tips and tales on pethub.com. We've got a lot of great uh, content there about raising Hetty and just tips and tales for raising your dog or your cat or any other kind of perfect kid that you might have at home. See you later guys.